Every lead in this film worked at the actor's studio for years, learning this method of acting. So much of this film is improvised. The scene in the taxi cab had no script. Uh, they did a simple acting exercise. They told Rod Steiger, the brother, what he had to do. He had to convince Brando, or Terry Malloy, not to talk. And he had that gun. Kazan said, at some point, take that gun out and try to convince him that way. And that whole thing that Brando does, pushing the gun away, pushing it back, and the conversation that follows, uh, that was all improvised by Brando and Steiger. Now, I, I told you before uh, that this was, that's why I, I told you about Kazan testifying before the committee. So here you see what many people think is Kazan's justification for uh, going before HUAC and naming names. But I don't think that's what the film is really all about. This is Jesus Christ Comes to Hoboken, New Jersey. To me, very clearly, the brother who sold him out when he had his chance to be somebody, Judas. Uh, Eva Marie Saint, both Marys. Uh, the mother and the woman who becomes a follower of him. The priest, John the Baptist. Uh, and Brando, of course, Jesus. Uh, in the beginning of the film, uh, the priest says, don't forget what a few people did that took down the Roman Empire. So they are telling you right from the beginning what this film is. Uh, Jonas, Johnny Friendly, Pontius Pilate. Um, if you watch this film, and I really wish that uh, we could do this now without sound, you will notice that almost every scene has a cross in it. When the two boys are sitting uh, up on the, uh, the pigeon hole, one is sitting, one is standing, and one is sitting across. All the TV antennas, you know what those are, right? And before cables, they, if you look at them, it looks like Calgary. It, it looks like a bunch of crucifixes, uh, crucifixes. That runs through the whole film. And then, of course, when, when Brando gets beaten up at the end, he's kind of dead. He, he really is just about dead. And the priest and, and Mary, the two followers, see him rise. So he rises from the dead, then walks into the factory, into the loading dock, and everybody follows him. So it's like the beginning of Christianity. That's what Kazan wanted to show. Now, was he identifying himself with Jesus? Maybe, but it doesn't matter uh, to us as film goers. What, what matters is the way this film builds right from the beginning with the body thrown off uh, the roof, Joey, and how slowly Brando gets pulled into this dilemma where people start talking to him about his conscience. And again, you, you have this idea of Christianity being born, this idea of sacrificing yourself for others so that you will live again through them. That's the power of the film. Um, this film ruined uh, Kazan's career uh, in Hollywood. This film was shot in New Jersey, in Hoboken, all the exterior shots on the docks, and the interiors were all shot up in the Bronx in New York where there was a small studio. Hollywood wanted nothing to do with this picture except Columbia. Columbia Pictures made it, funded it, because Brando was so hot 
after um, Streetcar Named Desire, uh, both on stage and on screen. The music was done by Leonard Bernstein. Uh, I don't know if you know who he was. He's the head of the Philharmonic and a million other orchestras. He also wrote West Side Story. And if you listen closely to this film, you can hear the beginning of what became the music from West Side Story. Uh, as I told you in the beginning, every film in the 50s, every worthwhile film, deals with this dilemma. Uh, whose responsibility is it to do the right thing against all of uh, the commissions, HUAC, the gang, the invaders in the town? All the, all the films have this theme because it was such an overwhelming self-destruction by Hollywood. And uh, finally, what I, what I want to tell you, and then if you have questions, I'll be happy to answer them. The performance by Marlon Brando is it's mystical. It, it's unearthly. Uh, you know, he was only, I think, 25 when he made the film. And all that makeup that he, he had no problem with making himself look like a, an ex-fighter. But the way he moves, uh, the way he, he handles himself like a boxer, it, it's, it's awesome. And all the choices. When the beginning, when they're walking in the park, just getting to know each other, she accidentally dropped her glove, the white glove, remember? Brando picks it up, puts it on his hand, and uh, plays with it. At one point, she tries to get it back. All of that improvised. Because the nature of the actor's studio was you are in the moment. Uh, you are there, and if something happens, then you react as you would react in real life. And so Brando was so deeply into this character that when he picks the glove up, uh, he puts it on. Uh, it, it's, uh, it, it's a beautiful moment in this film, one of many. Lee J. Cobb's performance as Johnny Friendly was astounding. Uh, it's so strong, so rough, so brutal. Rod Steiger's performance as the brother, heartbreaking. Uh, that scene with him on the hook is it's a heartbreaker. Eva Marie Saint, astonishing in this film, her first film. And uh, as I say, she won the Oscar. This is a film where you see where Hollywood changed. After this film, everybody wanted to act in this style. Uh, you know, no more uh, posing, uh, and no more looking a certain way, feeling a certain way, following a script. This is the film that introduces modern filmmaking. And don't forget, it's an independent film just distributed by Columbia. So here's the future. This is the future of film, independent filmmaking. And, uh, you know, for Kazan to take on such a... a controversial subject and raise it to the level of the birth of Catholicism and the crucifixion of Jesus, even if you don't see it. When Brando gets up at the end, um, there is such a sense of, uh, of triumph, of uh, rebirth, of, of uh, bravery, of sacrifice, that you get it even if you don't get it. Um, there's never been a film quite like this. Brando never worked like this again because when they asked him why he didn't make more movies like this, he said that it was too painful. So what does that mean? That means that because he was working from the inside, you know, the, the method, the method acting, and he had to reach for all of this uh, all of this emotion, too difficult for him to keep doing it. It's only uh, 19 years later that he plays the Godfather. So, uh, you know, this is a moment in film history uh, that is astounding. And um, when you see it, 
I promise you, you'll never forget this film. Uh, or Brando. Uh, Brando, it's a film for the ages. A hundred years from now, when people see this film, uh, and they don't know anything about HUAC and testifying, this film will still work on every level. Um, so I'm glad, I'm glad I, I had a chance to show it to you tonight because you should know what great filmmaking is all about, and you saw it tonight. But by the way, the cinematographer also won an Academy Award. Everybody who went to the film won an Academy Award. It was just, you know. Okay, so anybody want to ask any questions? Uh, it was, the, the beating was the crucifixion. I think the, the crucifixion is, is the, the holy way. It's, I think what goes on is the beating the Roman soldiers do to the Christ. Right. It, that in, in the crucifixion, the Golgotha is going to be going to work. So I, I see it a little bit differently. It's not, and I also see the, when he unhangs the, the brother, Charlie, from, the, it's probably similar to unhanging Christ from the church, or from the cross. That's right. So I think there are many allusions to the crucifixion. And I, I also think the, it's very interesting how uh, the, the, uh, the, um, the crucifixion the, the, of, of Christ in the movie uh, in the Mel Gibson, Mel Gibson uh, does a very good, uh, in the crucifixion, the scene where his, uh, Christ has, after the crucifixion and after the beatings, a lot of blood in his mouth, very very similar. I I was came up right away uh, that image of the Christ after he was being beaten up, and after his crucifixion is very similar to this this scene here. Uh, that's right. And if you notice, besides the Roman comment in front of the film, and when, when uh, the priest in the church says, you know, just. You, Remember what a few, a few were able to do against the Romans if they were the right few. And then in the middle of the film, you see another crucifixion, uh, K.O. Dugan, who gets murdered. And that's really the turning point for Brando uh, when they start throwing things at, uh, at the priest. Uh, you know, when the, the articles were written in 1948, the ones that won the Pulitzer, they were the story of the priest. He was the main character. And what he did was really, in, in the film, what Terry Malloy does. Uh, it, it's, again, Kazan who wants to shift the attention. Carl Malden's performance as the priest, unforgettable. Just, just so powerful. And so everything in this film goes against every cliche you see in, in films. Um, this, this structure in this film is so meticulous and so powerful that as it builds to the end, right up to the end, you don't know what's going to happen. When uh, you know, he puts on the jacket, the robe, you remember Jesus' robe, gets passed in this film from... Uh, person to person who's been sacrificed. Joey, K.O. Dugan, and then Brando gets it. And when he goes down for that fight, you don't know what's going to happen. But I'm sure nobody went for popcorn during that, that scene. And those, that fight that they have, when you see Brando just pummeling uh, Lee J. Cobb, who's supposed to be this big tough guy, and then needs his henchmen to come in, it's very powerful, it's very moving, and it's, it's very right. So all, all the scenes that, uh, not all the scenes, all, all, the whole movie uh, that Kazan put together, as I always say in my film classes, uh, what you're not seeing is Kazan's work. You're seeing the results of Kazan's work. And uh, he really, because he identifies so much with Brando, he discovered Brando for uh, Streetcar Named Desire on Broadway. He himself feels crucified for what he did before HUAC. And that is where the power of this film lies. Brando could have made so many other choices 
that would have reduced this film, but he stayed with it. He stayed in character. Uh, one of my uh, favorite scenes in this film is when uh, she's home, and he, he says, open the door, open the door, let me in. She says, no, no, go away. And he breaks the door down and half the building. I mean, he, he, he's animal-like. There's a little bit of Stanley Kowalski in him. But it, it's so powerful. And then he goes to Edie, and she can no longer resist. She becomes part of his following. So uh, we could talk about this film for hours and um, just begin to scratch the surface. Um, does anybody else ha have a question or a comment or something you want to say? Yeah, in the back. We have a mic coming up your way. Uh, I just wanted to say, like, there was this scene that completely, like, blew me away. Like, the scene where uh, Marlon Brando confesses that to Eddie that he was involved in the murder. And they go, like, to the near the ships and... And like they, you, you can't really hear them because there's like a lot of like noise. I found that completely like amazing because honestly, for like a movie of those, that time, it was completely different from anything that I've seen. Even nowadays, filmmakers don't or aren't as bold to like have like such an important scene being completely like muted by other noises. So I don't know. I don't know exactly what the purpose was, but I thought it was really different, and I love that. I don't know what you think about it. Uh, that's a good comment. You don't have to hear it. You know what he's going to say. And Kazan makes a choice to have these sounds go off, these whistles. And, don't, and the whistle, by the way, is an echo of the whistle that the, uh, the guy who hires people. There, there are these sounds that keep recurring in this film. And because he doesn't want to be script-oriented completely, uh, you don't, it's more powerful not hearing the confession, seeing it, and hearing the sounds of the waterfront around him. You know what he's saying, and she knows what he's saying, and the priest knows what he's saying. So um, that's a director's choice. That really works. Uh, it, it just makes it that much more uh, intimate in its own, its own way. Um, Good comment. Uh, anybody else? OK, then. So uh, thank you all for coming. I'm glad you had this experience. Uh, if you're a director, you can learn from the choices Kazan made. If you're a screenwriter, Bud Schulberg's dialogue is so colorful. Um, you know, rat means that you, you, rat, you tell on somebody. He calls them cheese eaters. The whole film is a very poetic uh, script by Schilberg. Uh, they worked one more time together in uh, A Face in the Crowd, which is another one of these astonishing movies. And really, that was it for Kazan. He made one film in uh, 1962, and Hollywood wouldn't go near him because um, Hollywood management identified with the Johnny Friendlies of the world and the, the working people identified with Malloy, Terry Malloy. That's why the film swept the Oscars, because management doesn't vote for Oscars, only workers, actors, screenwriters, directors, uh, set designers, producers, and, uh, and uh, uh, studio heads do not vote. Um, obviously, it would be a contradiction for them. So everybody loved this film, and everybody loved Brando in it. But as I say, he, he couldn't get there again. It, it was like sticking a knife in his soul, and he, he just didn't. He made other choices, but not, not this. So you, you see what happens when you work together, when you all work in the, in the same method, it, you get this magic that comes off the screen that is compelling uh, uh, in a way that uh, very few films even approach. Yeah. Just one last thing. It's too much temptation to, uh, not to ask this question. Please. In The Last Tango in Paris, 
um, you, sa you said that Marlo Brando was uh, very interested in how he learned how to act. But would it uh, this way, you know, how you to feel to be able to act? And how about the effect it had on Maria Schreiber? Yeah, I don't know if you know this film, uh, Last Tango in Paris, but she literally went crazy. She was so disturbed. Uh, I won't go into what happens in that film. That's not the point, but it's just Brando felt it was Brando felt it was important to feel like this, to act better. Yeah, I also think that Brando made it because everybody thought he was an old man after The Godfather. And uh, he wanted to show that he was not an old man. It's a difficult film. It's, uh, it's uh, Bertolucci, I believe. And you know, the Europeans see all of this completely differently. Uh, they loved this film um, because of Brando. And even if they didn't understand the language or anything, the electricity comes off the screen so, so strongly. And, and interestingly, in Last Tango, it doesn't. Uh, it, 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 and I don't think Brando cared. Uh, you know, he didn't have to. They paid him anyway. And uh, for Maria Schrei Schreiber, Schreiber, yeah, uh, she suffered greatly from that film. And uh, there are things that go on that uh, go see it sometime and uh, see what you think. But uh, you know, this, this point, this is why I say in my classes um, that auteurism, as my students know, means you have to see all the films of a director. And sometimes, as, as I told you, uh, the actor is the one uh, who you focus on. So if you see this film and no other Brando film, you lose something in uh, the understanding of Brando as an actor. So you see all of his films, this one takes its place uh, in the uh, pantheon of uh, Marlon Brando. Anybody else? Oh, by the way, did you know that Frank Sinatra was supposed to play this role of Terry Malloy? And he sued Columbia because they, Columbia wouldn't fund the film with Frank Sinatra. Can you imagine Frank Sinatra as Terry Malloy going down to the dock and singing My Way? I, I, um, and uh, after, after uh, um, Frank Sinatra, Brando was offered the part, and the film was, it depended upon whether or not he would do it. That's, that's when they would fund the film, Harry Cohn of Columbia. He didn't want to do it because he too was offended by what Kazan had done. But Kazan convinced him uh, that this film was about something greater. And so he agreed to do it, Columbia agreed to fund it, and it uh, became one of the classics of all time uh, in my top personal five. Okay, I want to thank you all very much for coming. I appreciate it. I hope you like the movie, and uh, I'll be seeing, seeing you all again. Thank you.